Hello, everyone. Thank you for attending today's webinar, Calculating Storage for Demand Events. This webinar is brought to you by Compressed Air Best Practices Magazine. This webinar is sponsored by Baco Technologies and Kaser Compressors. Our keynote speaker today is Tom Toronto from Data Power Services. And our sponsor speakers are Jason Brister from Baco Technologies and Neil Meltretter from Kaser Compressors. My name is Kimberly Vickman and I'm the Sustainability Digital Marketing Specialist for Compressed Air Best Practices Magazine. I will be troubleshooting this webinar and moderating the Q&A session, so please bear with me while I go over some logistics. One of our most frequently asked questions is for access to the presentation slides and the recording. Both will be, a bit, be available following the webinar. A link to the recording and presentation slides will be made available to attendees via email later today. Also, if you requested a PDH certificate, that will be emailed to you next week, Monday. I'd also like to quickly go over our Q&A format, which will take place at the end of the session. Please use your question window to submit questions and direct them to Compress Air Best Practices Magazine. If we do not get to your question during the allotted time, we will follow up personally with an email. We also have some handouts available for all attendees. Tom Toronto has provided a compressed air storage chart. Baco Technologies has provided two of their desiccant dryer brochures. Kaser Compressors has provided a handout on system optimization. Handouts will also include the August issue of Compressed Air Best Practices magazine. This slide is a disclaimer. The basic message is that each system is unique and you need to, cons to consult with system specialists to come up with your own specifications. Methanodia communication does not assume and hereby disclaims any liability to any person or company for any loss or damage caused by errors or emissions in the materials of this webinar. And before we begin the presentations today, I would like to make you all aware of our Best Practices 2020 online event happening September 23rd to the 24th. Please consider allocating some time to attend our live keynotes and discussion forum, as well as hours of pre-recorded sessions. We have announced our keynote speakers, which will include Chad Larrabee from the Compressed Air and Gas Institute, Thomas Paglucchio from Abbey, Steve Briscoe from the Compressed Air Challenge, and Stephen Coppinger from Cal Portland. The event is free and you can register at cabexpo.com. And now for a word from our publisher, Rod Smith. Thank you, Kimberly. Hello, everybody. Welcome to today's event. And I just wanted to take a second to express how excited we are about this 2020 online event happening September 23rd and 24th. It's new to us, but thanks to Kimberly and Bill Smith, it's, it's really happening in the compressed air industry. The Energy Star program and others are strongly supporting it. It, it has many pre-recorded sessions, up to 25 pre-recorded sessions coming from the leading experts in the United States. It has, they're organized into five tracks. Track one is compressed air technology fundamentals and maintenance. So if you have plants out there who can benefit from rotary screw air compressor, refrigerated air dryer, centrifugal air compressor, measurement, fundamentals and maintenance training, we have the leading experts in the world providing those presentations. And that's just track one. So it goes into system auditing and track two, it goes into blower and vacuum optimization and fundamentals in track three. It has aeration blower sizing and specs in track four. And finally, track five is chiller and cooling tower fundamentals and maintenance. It's free to attend. You just log in. It's, it's like a big webinar aside from this live keynote session. So we'd love to have you attend and uh, you can register at cabpexpo.com. Thank you, Kimberly. Thank you. All right, thank you. So the goal of today's session is to discuss design calculations to engineer storage volume for specific applications. Um, we will review calculating storage volume for the anticipated shutdown of a compressor um, as well as calculating, uh, as discussing calculating dedicated storage volume to improve performance of a high speed flying cutoff cylinder. We will do our best today to keep this webinar to an hour long session, but feel free to reach out to us afterwards if you have any questions. 
Our keynote speaker today is Tom Toronto. Mr. Toronto is the owner hey, of Data Joe Force. Allen, we got the new thermostat for your 40 horse Palatec air compressor. I was calling to see when would be a good time for us to shut that down and change that out for you. Could you please give me a call back at 309-762-8096. Ask for Joe and we can schedule that. Thank you. Um, sorry, sorry about that. I heard some noise here. Um, so Mr. Toronto is the owner of Data Power Services. He has over 45 years of experience in the compressed air industry, is a DOE energy expert, compressed air challenge committee member and instructor, as well as an instructor for Airmaster Plus training. And now we'll give access to Tom to take over those slides. Okay, Kimberly, thank you very much. Glad, glad thank you as well. Um, today we're gonna talk about uh, storage and how storage can help with compressed air system performance. And we're going to talk some about the rules of thumb for compressed air storage that have been used over the years. But more importantly, we're going to talk about how air receivers work and the different ways storage can be used. And then we're going to go into calculating storage for a few different uh, typical applications. Rules of thumb. Um, years ago, uh, inlet modulation control uh, gave rise to the fact that, oh, well, you don't need storage. I'll just use your piping as storage. And uh, those of us that uh, were living through that time realized that uh, even though the compressor control maybe doesn't need storage, the system still benefits from storage. One gallon per CFM, that was a rule of thumb back in the day when double acting reciprocating compressors were the, the norm. And today with uh, lubricant injected rotary screws, three to five gallons per CFM of the trim compressor is a number that we hear um, applied in a lot of situations. And that, that number is actually born out of this uh, chart from Compressed Air Challenge, which shows the relationship of power and percent capacity of a lubricant injected rotary screw compressor. And this has somewhat kind of become the norm, but this particular chart is for a very specific situation with a compressor load on load ma machine using a 10 PSI control band and where the sump blowdown occurs in 40 seconds of time. And this is to provide uh, some good unloaded power characteristics. So uh, these rules of thumb really don't serve us well uh, it's much better to understand how receivers work and actually engineer the storage. So for example, if we have an air receiver with a 1200 gallon size and it's sitting there on the floor and it's open, all the ports are open, uh, we buy receivers in terms of gallons. But when we calculate receiver capacity, we need to deal with the, um, cubic feet. So 1200 gallons is 160 cubic feet. If this tank is sitting here at zero PSI gauge, there's still 160 cubic feet of air in it. And so that leads us to uh, beginning to understand how storage can work. If we were to put the uh, flanges on covers on here, and we were to put another volume of air into that tank, the pressure is going to go up. And so if we want the pressure to be two atmospheres, how much volume do we have to put in? Well, we have got to put in 160 cubic feet. So at atmospheric pressure, we have 160 cubic feet of air in there. If we push another 160 cubic feet of air in, then we go, we double the pressure to two atmospheres. And so fundamentally, this is the way air receivers work. And it's the ideal gas laws, pressure and volume divided by temperature. And for the most part, we don't um, consider temperature generally. We um, only uh, use pressure and volume unless there's a big temperature difference. Now, that's air going into receiver. And as we, if we wanna know how much air would come out of a receiver, 
we look at the compression ratio. And the compression ratio is simply the uh, initial, final pressure of the receiver tank minus the initial pressure and divide by atmospheric pressure. And you'll notice that 101.5 minus 87 equals 14.5. And we divide that by atmosphere of 14.5, we'd have a ratio equal to one. So if we were to start out with a receiver at 100 PSI gauge, uh, eight atmospheres is 101 and a half or 116 uh, pounds absolute. And if we were to lower the pressure by one atmosphere, 14.5, then we would get 160 cubic feet of air out of our 1200 gallon tank. So for every one atmosphere change of the, the pressure in a 160 cubic foot tank, we're either going to put in or take out one uh, volume of that tank. And of course, that's the basis of the calculations that we use. Now, we have to understand that we have two volumes we're talking about here. One is the volume of the gas or the volume of the air, and the other is the volume of the receiver. So the volume of the gas equals the volume of the receiver times the compression ratio. The volume of the receiver equals the volume of the gas times one over the compression ratio. So if, for example, we want to know how much air comes out of our 160 cubic foot tank, that's the receiver volume. When we go from 105 down to 87 PSI, and we have 14.5 PSI atmosphere, the volume of gas expelled from the tank is 160 cubic feet. On the other hand, if we want to know what size receiver do we need, if we want 160 cubic feet of gas to be able to store in the tank at one atmosphere pressure differential, 14.5 PSI, then the volume of the receiver has to be 160 cubic feet. Now, this is dealing in gas volume and receiver volume. But when we talk about the gas volume, we're usually talking about cubic feet per minute. So if we take the cubic feet per minute flow rate times the number of minutes of time, the minutes cancel and that gives us the cubic feet of gas. So most often when we're looking at sizing a receiver tank, if I need Q number of cubic feet per minute for T number of minutes times atmosphere pressure divided by the final pressure minus the initial pressure of the tank, that tells me the volume in cubic feet of the receiver necessary to accomplish that job. Okay, so how can we use receivers? Well, we can use them on the supply side, which we call primary storage, to improve compressor control. In the case of the load unload lubricant injected rotary screw compressor, um, provide pneumatic energy. And one of the things that's very common is, what if a compressor shuts down? It takes time for a standby compressor to come on. And so how would we size the storage to accommodate that? On the demand side, what we call secondary storage. We've got high volume intermittent demands or large air users. We have dedicated storage that can be dedicated to a particular end use. And we have just increasing system volume, which helps stabilize pressure on an overall basis. So those are some of the things that we can use storage for. And to begin with, we want to talk about what happens during the unanticipated shutdown of an air compressor. Well, if we're going along and we've got a compressor that is uh, making air and all of a sudden it shuts down on high temperature, obviously we can use storage to help make up the difference of air 
and design it to supply air during the time it takes the backup compressor to start. Now, let's look at this case. We have a base load compressor operating at 400 cubic feet per minute. We have a trim compressor with a capacity of 425 cubic feet per minute, actually running at an average flow of 362 cubic feet per minute. If the base load compressor shuts down on high temperature, production is presently interrupted. So the question becomes, if, if the standby compressor drops to 87 PSI, the pressure drops before the standby comes on, and then it takes 35 seconds for the standby to begin making air, and the plant pressure can't drop below 80 PSI or else production is gonna be inter interrupted, what size tank do we have to have? Well, we know that the base load compressor is 400 cubic feet per minute, and that's the one that shuts down. The trim compressor is 425 cubic feet per minute, but it's only running at an average of 362 CFM. So we actually have 63 CFM of what we call rotating reserve capacity. Because the first thing that's going to happen when the 400 CFM base load machine goes away, the trim compressor is going to come to full load. So we're going to gain 63 of the 400 cubic feet per minute back. So our flow deficit that we have to make up is actually 337 cubic feet per minute. And that is the Q in our equation, the flow rate that we need to do. Now we know the backup compressor starts at 87 PSI. So the 35 seconds starts ticking at 87 PSI so our initial pressure of the tank for storage calculations is going to be the 87 PSI. And the permissive start time of the compressor is 35 seconds. But we want cubic feet per minute. We're dealing with cubic feet per minute. So we've got to have the time in minutes. Take 35 divided by 60, it's 0.583 minutes. And we know that if the pressure goes below 80 PSI, we're going to interrupt production. So if we plug these numbers into our equation, our 337 CFM is the deficit. Our 0.583 minutes is the time. We are going to have a final pressure of 80 PSI and an initial pressure of 87. We come up with a calculation of 407 cubic feet. But we buy tanks in gallons. So 407 cubic feet times 7.5 four, eight gallons per cubic foot, we come up with 3,000 gallons of storage would do this job. Now you'll notice, where does our three to five gallons per CFM leave us? Well, this storage requirement for permissive startup time requires seven gallons per CFM of the trim compressor. So the three to five gallon rule of thumb is really only for efficient unloading and loading of a lubricant injected rotary screw compressor. If you want to cover a standby event, like uh, unanticipated shutdown of a compressor, do the calcs. Large air demand events. There are another thing that happens in systems that can upset the apple cart. And this is a particular example of a dense phase transport system with a peak air demand of 670 SCFM, which is our green line here. You can see this data tracing. The green line is the flow coming up to just over 650 CFM. Now, the available storage pressure, we have our sawtooth pattern, which is the load unloading of the compressor. You'll notice that we come down to about 96 PSI. And so we can't design the storage up here at 103 because, of course, it'd be just my luck that when we need the storage, the pressure is going to be down here. So we have to use our available storage pressure is 96 PSI. And the time duration of the event is measured here in our data recording, and it is 1.2 minutes. We're going to supply 600 CFM from storage. The other 70 will have spare air. There's going to, some air is going to fill the tank as the tank's being depleted. So we're going to calculate based on a 600 CFM requirement. 
and our minimum pressure is 85 PSI. Because in this particular system, here right here, you see we dipped to 85. If we go any lower than that, the packaging department would start shutting down on, uh, low, on low pressure cutouts. So 85 is our limit. Okay, so peak air demand 670, initial pressure is 96, time is 1.2 minutes, 600 CFM. We can't go below 85. So again, here's our formula. CFM times minutes times one over the compression ratio. We have 600 cubic feet per minute, 1.2 minutes, 14.5 PSI atmospheric pressure. Our final pressure is 85, our initial pressure is 96. So we have 11 PSI of pressure differential and we come up with a 7,000 gallon tank. So for the system to ride out that event and ensure that the pressure doesn't dip below uh, 85 PSI, we need an additional 7,000 gallons of storage. Now that is using storage as primary storage in the compressor room. Now, these are the charts, this is one of the charts that's in the handout. And it's kind of uh, uh, relatively easy to use because if we've got 600 cubic feet per minute for 1.2 minutes, that's 720 cubic feet of air is how much we need. And our pressure differential is 11 PSI. Well, you notice the five PSI differentials, this bottom curve, 30 PSI differential is the top curve. The yellow curve is 10 PSI. So we're gonna be just a little bit over 10 PSI differential. So if we want 720 cubic feet of air, which is 600 CFM for 1.2 minutes, and we've got 11 PSI differential, the chart shows us we need a 7,000 gallon tank. So I made up these charts for my own use so I don't have to crunch the numbers so much. You can just uh, look it up on the, on the chart. And I've got a couple of different charts in the handout with uh, different ranges for you if, you if you'd like to use them. So this is solving for the large air demand event using primary storage in the compressor room requires 7,000 gallons. We also have dedicated storage, which might be dedicated to a critical machine. We've got general system volume, which is just additional volume added to the, the system. Or we've got dedicated storage for high volume intermittent demands where we supply the large demand event directly. Now you'll notice that the minimum pressure for the demand event is 40 PSI but we can't let the pressure back at the compressor room drop to 40 PSI because it'll disturb everything else in the plant. But with this refill control, isolating the high volume storage from the system, we can now drop the high volume storage all the way down to 40 PSI and our large air demand is still gonna be satisfied. So what does that change for us? Well, you remember, instead of having 11 PSI differential, now we've got a lot more pressure differential to work with, 56 PSI. So if we come over here to our calculation, we still have the same 600 cubic feet per minute for 1.2 minutes, but now our final pressure is 40 instead of 85, and our initial pressure is still 96, and we come up with a 1400 gallon tank. So Having the greater pressure differential available, we've got the ability to solve this problem with a much smaller, more economical air receiver. So again, engineer the storage to fit the job that you need it to do. And there's generally more than one way to skin a cat. So, the last thing we're gonna talk about is improving the speed and thrust of a high-speed pneumatic cylinder. To do this, we need to look at our cylinder, which is two inches in diameter, 18 inches stroke length, and it has a one inch diameter piston rod. 
our operating parameters are a cycle every six seconds or a tenth of a minute. Our initial pressure is 80 PSI and it's regulated and we can let the pressure fall by three PSI. But what's the flow rate? How much flow does it take to make a two inch cylinder stroke out and back 18 inches in a tenth of a minute? That's a problem. We need to know, we need to calculate our flow rate, right? So to calculate our flow rate, we have to calculate the physical volume of the cap end of the cylinder. We have to calculate the rod end volume, which is equal to the volume of the cylinder without the rod in it, minus the volume of the rod. And then we need to calculate the actual gas volume because we're looking for how many standard cubic feet per cycle we need. So just like the formula where we calculated the gas volume in a receiver, we can calculate the gas volume of a cylinder by using the final pressure minus the initial pressure divided by atmosphere and what is the volume of the cylinder. So if we solve for the area, that's pi r squared, but we've got the diameter or the radius in inches. So there's another formula, which is pi times d squared over four times 144. What this does is it calculates the area and converts it to square feet all in one step for us. So our two inch diameter cylinder has an area of 0 0.022 cube, uh, square feet. The one inch diameter rod has an area of 0 0.0054 square feet. So our volume of the cap end is the bore times the stroke. The volume of the rod end is the bore area minus the rod area times the stroke. So the cap end is 0 0.022 times 1.5 feet, 18 inches stroke. We get 0 0.033 cubic feet physical volume. The rod end, if we subtract out the one inch rod uh, from the area of the main uh, bore times the one and a half feet, we come up with 0.245 cubic feet. So the volume for one stroke out and back totals 0 0.573. Again, that's cubic feet volume. But what we need to know is what is the gas volume? So this same formula that we use for a receiver to calculate the gas volume, we can use for the cylinder. The volume of the cylinder times the compression ratio is the volume of gas per cycle. So we take the volume of the cylinder, 0 0.573, and our, our final pressure, or our initial pressure is 80 PSI, and our final pressure our, our, or excuse me, our, our final pressure is 80. That's what the cylinder's got to get pressurized up to. Our initial pressure is negative 14.5 because if we were to stroke that cylinder out, it's going to go into a vacuum unless we put air in. So it's 80 minus a negative 14.5 or 80 plus 14.5 divided by 14.5 the gas volume per cycle is 0.373 cubic feet of gas. Now, what is that in terms of flow rate? Well, our 0.373 cubic feet of gas per six seconds times 60 seconds in a minute is 3.7 CFM, 3.7 cubic feet per minute. So that's our flow rate that we need. We can now come to our storage formula, right? and we can calculate what size receiver we need to have. We know that our, our flow rate is 0.373 cubic feet per minute. Our initial pressure is 80. Our final pressure is 77. We could only drop by three. And our time is one-tenth of a minute. If we plug all those numbers into the formula, what we come up with is a 1.8 cubic foot 
receiver times 7.48, it's 13 and a half gallons. It's a very small receiver. And, and that's typical of these end use applications where the cylinder doesn't have the volume it needs to move. And so it starts to stall and have problems. If you do these calculations, the receivers are usually pretty small. And here's the little receiver piped into the system that's operating this high speed cylinder. Now you'll notice the way we pipe it in, the filter and the regulator are upstream, but then we tee the receiver into the line ahead of the lubricator because we still got to get lubrication to that cylinder. So be sure that the receiver is ahead upstream of the lubricator. If you put it downstream of the lubricator, all the lubricant's just gonna end up in the receiver tank and none of it's gonna get to the cylinder. So again, there's a way that you can engineer to improve the speed, thrust, and torque of a high-speed cylinder. So uh, it's, a, it, it's good to engineer your storage, don't just simply use rules of thumb. Kimberly? All right, um, thank you, uh, Mr. Toronto. And I just wanna remind everyone, I am getting some questions in, um, but send your questions in if you have them. We'll have the Q&A session at the end of the webinar. Next up, um, next up uh, is we have Jason Brister. Um, Mr. Brister is the product manager with Vico Technologies and has 12 years of experience in the low pressure air industry. He has a bachelor's degree in mechanical engineering. Um, now I will give, make sure Jason has the controls. Thank you, Kim. So my presentation is titled Storage Considerations When Using Desiccant Dryers. And I'd like to thank everyone for attending and hope this provides some useful information. To start, um, we have a layout showing a typical compressed air system. As you can see, the compressors flow into a primary or wet receiver, um, followed by several dryers, refrigerant dryer, desiccant dryer, serving different areas of the process. This diagram highlights Vico's air treatment products and where they fit into the compressed air system. We should point out here that Vico does not supply receivers or provide uh, sizing, uh, storage sizing calculations, but we will discuss some things to keep in mind with respect to storage for systems uh, using desiccant dryers. Of course, Vico provides a comprehensive line of compressed air treatment products, including filtration and condensate management. Many of you are familiar with our Vico cat, um, excuse me, Vico mat uh, automatic condensate drains, uh, various types of dryers along with oil-free and measurement technologies. Many of you are probably familiar with drying technologies, but this graph provides an overview of the drying landscape and the operating envelopes for several common uh, types of dryers. The vertical scale at left shows uh, outlet pressure dew point with um, air, air volume flow increasing to the right on the horizontal scale. The green area represents refrigerated dryers. So you notice that they only operate at pressure dew points above uh, around 37 or 38 degrees Fahrenheit. The red area represents membrane dryers, frequently used for smaller point of use applications. We'll focus on desiccant dryers represented by the yellow area. And as you can see, they're used to achieve pressure dew points of 40 degrees and below. Looking at desiccant dryers, these are twin tower designs that operate with one, dry, one tower drying the compressed air stream while the desiccant in the offline tower is regenerated. By regenerated, we mean the process of removing water from the desiccant in preparation for the next drying cycle. 
the desk skin is regenerated using a small stream of dry air bled off from the dryer's outlet. And this dry regeneration air pulls water from the desk skin and is exhausted to the environment. This regeneration air is often referred to as purge air, and the purge rate is the percentage of the dryer's nominal capacity that is consumed during regeneration. Because a dryer is not always consuming purge air, it's important to note that the average purge rate and the instantaneous purge rate can differ. Three common types of desiccant dryers are heatless or pressure swing, heated purge, and heated blower purge, which all have different purge rates. As this slide shows, uh, while a typical desiccant dryer shown at left will have an average purge rate of 15%, the instantaneous or max purge rate is usually around 20%. Similarly, on the far right for the heated blower purge, um, the average purge rate uh, is much lower than for a heatless dryer, but it still has a higher instantaneous or maximum purge rate. The lower purge rate for a heated blower type dryer is because these, these types of dryers only consume air for the desiccant cooling phase. For the desiccant dryers shown on the previous slide, this graph provides a relative comparison of capital cost versus operating cost, assuming dryers have the same nominal capacity. As you can see, the heated blower purge dryer has the highest initial cost, but also the, is the most efficient to operate, therefore the lowest operating cost. At the opposite end of the spectrum, the heatless dryer has a lower initial cost, but a higher operating cost. This higher operating cost is the result of the higher purge air requirement. With regard to storage for compressed air storage systems, compressed air systems using desiccant dryers, the question is also uh, often what type of receivers to use, wet or dry. Wet receivers are standard practice and are important as they help protect dryers and downstream equipment from potential pressure pulsations. Wet receivers are also beneficial because they help protect downstream equipment um, I'm sorry, they help um, provide radiant cooling and promote condensate dropout. Both of these are helpful for downstream dryers and filters. However, if a wet receiver is the only storage in a system with a downstream desiccant dryer, a large demand event can potentially overwhelm the dryer, resulting in a dew point spike. Therefore, for systems with desiccant dryers, dry air storage is also recommended as it does provide some key benefits. These include ensuring sufficient dry air is available for intermittent large demand events, such as a bag house application that has uh, uses diaphragm pulse valves. Also, having a reservoir of dry air can help, excuse me, having a reservoir of dry air can help promote, protect the process against potential dew point spikes. And lastly, dry storage can help buffer variations in flow resulting from dryer purge consumption. So to summarize, for desiccant dryer installations, it's usually a good idea to have both wet and dry receivers. Revisiting the compressed air schematic we saw earlier, we now show the recommended dry receiver after the desiccant dryer. We will now look at a practical example of how a, a dry receiver can be useful for a desiccant dryer system. In this case, let's consider a compressor and heatless desiccant dryer, both with nominal 100 SCFM capacities. The process demand is a continuous 85 SCFM, which is consistent with the average outlet flow rate of the dryer, represented by the green line. This is the 15% average purge consumption from the dryer. However, as mentioned earlier, the dryer's maximum instantaneous flow is 20% or 20 SCFM in this case, shown by the red line. Therefore, without any dry storage, the process will see this fluctuation in flow resulting from the dryer purge cycling on and off, meaning the process is short of air when the dryer is purging. Adding a properly sized dry receiver would improve the system since having a buffer of dry air would better meet the continuous process demand. We would better match this green average line. So 
So with that, I've reached the end of this presentation. I hope uh, this was maybe a helpful tip for some of you dealing with compressed air systems. Um, I'd like to thank everyone for their time. And if you have any questions, certainly contact us. I would also encourage um, everyone to visit uh, Beco, Technologies dot, uh, Beco Technologies Corp on LinkedIn as we continually publish um, useful information and updates at that uh, site. And with that, I'll turn it back over to Kimberly. Thank you. All right. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Brister. All right. Um, now our next speaker um, is going to be Neil Meltrotter. Mr. Meltrotter is an engineering manager at Kaiser Compressors. Um, he's an Airmaster Plus certified, a certified energy manager, as well as um, a Compressed Air and Gas Institute certified compressed air system specialist. Now I will give um, Neil access to his presentation. Thanks, Kimberly. All right, excellent. Uh, appreciate that, Jason and Tom. Um, I like to call this portion of the webinar uh, the lightning round of uh, sizing and design. So I'll try not to go too fast. And uh, without further ado. OK. Um, you know, when we thought about putting this together, there's a lot of different things you can consider in sizing and design. but Let's say the top four here uh, when evaluating large demand events, or as they're typically called in the industry, say high intermittent demand events. Uh, number one, uh, consider compressor controls as well as master controls in your design. And we're going to see some examples as we go through. Uh, number two, uh, base pipe size and also storage volume on expected compressor operation. You know, we saw some examples from Tom. And uh, also consider the demand events. Again, Tom showed us some of those examples. Considering wet, dry, and point of use storage um, is, a, is a great way um, to move forward. Finally, a design with flexibility. So consider the future, what, what may or may not happen. And uh, the last critical item here is uh, you can have the best compressor or station on paper, but the infrastructure can dictate its success. Regarding compressor controls, uh, there are two types, and we'll talk about both. Individual controls as well as master controls, or sometimes called system controls. The individual control, or compressor controls, they're going to provide safe local operation by monitoring and controlling all relevant signals and components of the compressor. Most modern compressors um, also keep track of maintenance information, and they typically have historical records with time and date stamps, along with alarm messages, which can then be pushed to the user via various means, such as email or text. Depending on the compressor type, there may be also various options on how to control the compressor, like uh, the load on load example we had earlier, or they could be equipped with variable speed, variable frequency, or uh, variable displacement controls. You may ask, how can the individual control um, information then translate to large intermittent demand events? Wow, we have accompaniment too, fabulous. Okay, um, for a data analysis standpoint, or from a data analysis standpoint, with a simple internet connection to your network, you can have access to emails, texts, and a whole lot more. Most individual controllers out there today have many functions to help explain what's going on in your system. Duty cycle for any compressor can really help you understand system operation, as well as uh, your critical information, such as warnings and alarms. If you can dial into your system, you can also see the current operation, like we're seeing here at the graphic down there at the bottom left. You know, so you can see my cursor here, you can see at 7.30, we're at basically zero pressure. Uh, the compressor then loads up, uh, pressure is met, and then the compressor unloads. And it follows that same pattern multiple times before pressure is finally met to the system. And this is actually a variable frequency drive compressor. So um, the drive then ramps down to meet the necessary demand. So we can look at this and we can also look at the duty cycle and see, okay, yeah, we're pretty close to 100%. Um, is this the typical operation? 
is this event here uh, a system demand event? And you know, likely, you know, based on the time frame, and then you know what we see subsequently is it's probably just a startup. But good information to have at your fingertips. Now the limitations of viewing data from your controller directly is that it could be limited. Our previous graphic was only about 15 minutes. If you're pulling this data through Modbus or Ethernet IP or something else, then you shouldn't have such limitations. Either way, many individual controllers store this data and it can be downloaded to paint a bigger picture on how the compressor is actually responding to demand events. And then this data can be discussed with your local compressed air provider. Regarding piping, um, we really don't have time today to talk about all the tips and tricks uh, for sizing, um, but the main points are to keep the velocities manageable. In a compressor room, high velocities can reduce contact time within air treatment components, meaning they'll be less effective. And in some cases, severely high velocities can damage that equipment. In the distribution, higher velocities means higher pressure drop, which could translate then, of course, to higher energy costs. Plus, if there's rust and scale in your piping, then this can easily be moved downstream to your point of use. In general, a good rule of thumb is to keep the pressure gradient from the compressor room to the point of use 10% of your operating pressure. When in doubt, check calculators and tables, as there are many available online. We've already talked a lot about storage already, and uh, Tom had a great graphic too in regard to um, you know, gallons per CFM. Uh, you know, storage in the compressor room is critical to operation, as well as keeping the compressors from overcycling, uh, which can lead to increased service intervals or reduce the lifetime of major components. Uh, not to mention uh, the potential effects on compressor when, or on production when compressors uh, shut down. Be flexible. You know, design with flexibility in mind. Um, in the future, you know, best laid plans often go awry and being flexible with your design choices up front, for example, with maybe multiple smaller compressors rather than one large one, or let's say increasing your distribution header one size above what's called for, uh, that can really help when it comes to system dynamics in the future. We talked about getting information from your controller, but what if you don't have that information available from the controller that you've got installed? Um, so, you know, monitoring your existing station is a great way to start. Pressure, flow, power for each of your compressors, as well as your operational signals, load, motor. Um, however, that's just the supply side. You know, how do you get a bigger picture on what's going on in your system? So if you're having issues in the facility, monitoring pressures and flows uh, in the demand side is going to help you complete that puzzle. <laughs> You know, here we see a fairly simple example of um, some additional pressure measurements to create that pressure profile for you across your system, um, as well as uh, a point of use flow meter. So putting everything in perspective. Looks like we have an advance there. Make sure. Okay, there we go. Um, wrapping up with master controls, uh, we'll look at a short case study, uh, just a brief overview before we start that with master controls or system controls. Um, these come into play if you're dealing typically with two or more compressors in a system. Uh, one key aspect of, uh, of monitoring your entire station uh, or, or even the compressed air system, multiple rooms, decentralized and so on, um, is that you can also include filters, dryers, valves, uh, et cetera, and then get a really big picture on what's going on. In this case that we're looking at right now, uh, the compressed air system was experiencing multi multiple service inter issues, dryers, compressors, and so on. And the station that we had uh, shown at left has uh, four compressors along with dryers and filtration, as well as two wet and two dry tanks. And those are uh, uh, desiccant dryers there, uh, Jason. So uh, good to see both wet and dry in the system. When we looked at the data uh, from the master controller on the digital display, we found a few periods where demand was low and then the compressors were idling, motors were on but not making any air. Uh, then there was uh, immediately followed by that low demand uh, was a somewhat sharp drop in operating pressure seen at the dry tank. 
And that constituted three of the four compressors to load to satisfy this demand event. And then they immediately unloaded after pressure was satisfied. So I think we saw a really good example um, from Tom uh, where you know we're trying to avoid this spike in the compressor room, uh, but ballooning the storage in the compressor room maybe is not a possibility. Uh, putting point of use storage is probably our best choice. So, you know, master controllers, they're going to have a wealth of information from messages and alarms uh, for the individual compressors as well as the station. Uh, it's going to put it all in one place and it's going to provide data for you to be able to trend and, and also um, show you some longevity. So a lot of these controllers have data for, for years, which is fabulous. So pulling this data can also uh, help identify uh, whether uh, it's a compressor control issue or uh, a point of use issue. And again, in our case, it was uh, really a point of use issue that was driving these sharp pressure drops in the compressor room and causing multiple machines to load. So reviewing historical data um, allowed for this trend analysis and, and helped identify that that point of use is really the critical issue here. In summary, uh, controls, you know, maintain compressor uh, operations safely, uh, whether it be um, individual or master, and uh, responds to demand events. Uh, both have a, a lot of good information, so, you know, take advantage. Uh, piping, limit that pressure drop in the system and minimize your velocities. Uh, storage in the compressor room is gonna provide you that control buffer, helping preserve the longevity of your compressed air system as well as energy savings. And then like Tom said, you know, have those permissive starts as well. Um, so if you do lose a compressor, you're ready to go. Uh, storage at the point of use is gonna eliminate noise back into the system and, and maintain um, operation, um, smooth operation at the point of use so that production is unaffected. And finally, flexibility, um, you know, design with the future in mind. So now we'll go back to Kimberly and um, we'll finish up with our Q&A. All right, um, thank you very much, Mr. Maltrotter. Um, now we will transition to the Q&A session of the webinar here. Um, we'll have roughly 10 minutes, but we'll try to be as efficient as possible in answering everyone's questions. If you'd like additional details on a topic, just submit the request in the questions window and we'll reach out to you following the webinar. Um, since we did have three speakers today, if you want to specify who your question is for, um, you can include that as well. Uh, we already do have some questions being asked. Um, the first one I have, if all the speakers want to unmute themselves, the first one I have is for Tom. Um, how do you use storage to avoid rapid cycling on a load-unload compressor? Well, that's a very good question. Uh, the rapid cycling can occur when there is a lack of sufficient volume for the system to carry load of demand while the compressor is in the unloaded state. And so you may reach a situation where the compressor stays unloaded just for a very short period of time. And that causes, that's one cause of short cycling. And the solution there is to increase the volume. But remember, the other factor that we always have to think about is the pressure differential that the tank is using. And so if you have a very narrow pressure differential on the tank, that can also cause short cycling, in which case the solution is to try to widen that pressure differential. And very often the pressure differential is negatively affected due to pressure drop through undersized piping or filters or treatment equipment that are really not capable of handling the flow that you're trying to put through them without a very large pressure drop. So uh, you, you've got to look at both factors in the equations, the, the rate of flow and the pressure uh, differential as well. And a very high rate of flow with little volume can cause short cycling or a high rate of flow with a very restrictive piping can also cause short cycling. So those are the two things you need to look at. All right, thank you so much, Tom. Um, next question will go to Jason from Baco. Um, your question is, is there a difference between dew point and pressure dew point? 
Um, so pressure dew point is the dew point at uh, whatever pressure you're operating. Uh, when you refer to dew point, you know, atmospheric, obviously that would be at atmospheric pressure. Um, so it is important to note, um, you know, that there's a difference between the two and um, you need to take that into consideration if you need um, a certain dew point within the compressed air system uh, that is at the operating pressure. Um, and th that dew point will reduce if you go from line pressure to atmospheric, uh, the pressure dew point will reduce further. So if you have uh, minus 40 um, in pressure dew point in the system and you go to an atmospheric, you release that air to atmosphere, then the air uh, as it is uh, introduced to the atmosphere will have a even lower pressure dew point as the pressure drops to atmospheric pressure. So th they are different. Great, hey, thanks, Jason. Um, next question we have is for Neil. Um, your question is, what duty cycle would make on-off controls effective? Sure, um, it, it's a good question. You know, duty cycle affects pretty much how your compressor is going to operate. Um, on-off controls, you know, I would say you want to be somewhere in the 70 plus percent range for it to be most effective. Um, you know, if if you're Lower at 50% is probably the worst you probably could run for a load on load compressor uh, from an energy standpoint, depending on how much storage volume you had. And I think Tom had a great slide uh, earlier to, to give you an indication of where you should be. Um, but yeah, I mean, 70, 80% is probably uh, the, the best place that you would want to be. But storage volume is really going to dictate. Um, you know, how well the compressor is going to operate from a maintenance standpoint and an energy standpoint, because you want the, if it's an oil flooded rotary screw, you want the machine to be able to to unload and then, you know, it's going to blow down and you might have, you know, depending on the size, you might have some time in between. Um, if you're lower than 50%, then you might have, you know, not enough time where you're up to temperature. And if you're not operating at a uh, high enough temperature, then you could be having water entrainment um, in, in your air end, and that, that could be detriment as well. So, yeah, I'd say certainly the higher the better, um, but storage volume will make a difference really on all of those um, duty cycles. All right, thanks so much, Neil. Um, we have another question for Tom. Your question is, when, when you calculate the storage volume at 7,098 gallons, do you need to oversize for safety, or can you drop it to 7,000 gallons? That's, that's a really good question. Um, and it, it really has to do with what assumptions you've made along the way. If you've made conservative assumptions along the way about the performance that you need, then I wouldn't have a problem saying, okay, we're going to use 7,000 instead of 7,098 gallons. But if you have been kind of playing it close to the razor's edge on your performance calculations, then you probably are wise to add a little extra um, in, in a situation like that. And you need to remember that we're typically going to purchase standard size air receivers. And so uh, you're going to probably go to the next larger size receiver uh, and um, you know, maybe in that case, uh, you're going to go with a 5,000-gallon uh, receiver plus a 3,000-gallon receiver. You're going to have 8,000 or however it's going to going to divvy up. So, uh, again, if you're relatively aggressive with your performance assumptions, then having some extra capacity, some safety factor built in on your final selection is a good idea. If, you're, if your performance calculations are already tempered somewhat, then it's less important. All right, uh, thank you very much, Tom. That takes us about to the end of our time here today. And I just wanna thank everyone for joining us today. I would like to encourage you all to take the brief survey as you leave the session. Um, our slides and recording of this webinar um, will be made available via email later today. I know I got a few questions about that. Um, and if you requested a PDH certificate, that will be emailed to you on Monday. Um, and next up, um, if you want to join us for our next webinar, that will be on Thursday, October 15th at 2 p.m. Eastern Time, Vacuum System Efficiency Projects. 
Our speaker then will be Chris Gordon from Blackhawk Equipment. Um, free registration is available on our website at airbestpractices.com slash magazine slash webinars. Uh, we hope to see you there. Uh, thank you again for attending today's webinar and I hope everyone has a great rest of the day.